This video will discuss the use of boundary conditions in molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo simulations. All right, so we have um, typically what we're trying to do in any type of molecular dynamics or any type of uh, uh, you know, atomistic chemical simulation. So we're trying to represent what is functionally an infinite system with some finite repeating sample. So, you know, we want the properties of, you know, bulk water, but we don't want to simulate uh, billions upon billions of atoms. We want to simulate something that is computationally feasible. Typically, that'll be something like thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of atoms. And even that can be quite large. But that's still minuscule compared to the type of sample you would get from even a small drop of water. Similarly, any kind of you know crystal structure, any type of uh, biological system, we're trying to represent um, the properties of a large sample with some much, much smaller uh, subset of it. So in order to do that, typically what we do is we set up what's called a repeating unit cell. So we can imagine we have some type of box and we have all of our atoms and our molecules and our simulation inside this box. And then this box is going to repeat itself in every direction. So in the X direction, it's going to repeat. In the Y direction, it's going to repeat. In the Z direction as well. And just keep going on towards infinity in every single direction imaginable. So our unit cell, we can imagine like some type of uh, like three-dimensional, in the three-dimensional particle in a box model, we have a similar type of thing where X is between zero and DX, the size of the box in the X direction. Y is between zero and DY size of the box in the y direction and z is between 0 and dz size of the box in the z direction so we have our original particle at coordinates x y and z the like for example the one i have circled here in yellow then we have what are called image particles at x plus nx times dx y plus ny times dy and z plus nz times dz so every unit in each direction uh, with these nx, ny, and nz being all integers. So repeating in every direction as far as we can go at every single integer, there's another copy of this original particle where we have images, an infinite number of them in x, y, and z. So as I mentioned, all three of these nx, ny, and z, in principle, they go from negative infinity to positive infinity. So this hopes to replicate our system and try to mimic it being essentially an infinite system with this uh, finite repeating sample. So I mentioned in our molecular mechanics chapter that the van der Waals energy, that converges fairly quickly because the slowest decaying term depends on 1 over r to the 6th. 1 over r to the 6th uh, decays pretty quickly. If you double your, or if you Let's see, if you quadruple your distance, then your interaction strength goes down by a factor of a thousand. So, you know, if you if you go to something that's 20 times further away, it's a million times less strongly interacting. So van der Waals energy converges fairly quickly. There are some nice numerical tricks you can use to converge that. The problem is electrostatics. That converges very slowly. It decays as one over R. Then you can imagine the number of image particles that you get as you have a, an expanding sphere around you. The number of image particles is going to expand cubically. So you have R cubed divided by R. So the number of image particles is actually expanding faster than you're converging there. So this is why if you have a charged, uh, if you have a net charge in your system, you're going to get an infinite uh, electrostatic energy because there are more particles increasing uh, faster than the interactions decay. So you actually have to make sure that your system barely even has a dipole as well, because that decays like R cubed, whereas the number of uh, image particles is increasing as R cubed as well. So this is why we have to have a neutral unit cell to have some finite electrostatic energy. And we know that, you know, every, that water and uh, salt crystals and everything doesn't have an infinite electrostatic energy. So we need to uh, replicate that in our model system. 
So typically, yes, we would do that type of thing. And then we'd have some numerical trick to include the interactions with all of the images. Um, that's more advanced than what I'm willing to insert the effort to code up for these examples in these chapters. So instead, what I use is I just use the system in a single box or cube, uh, sorry, cube or a sphere. And then at the edge of the sphere, I basically have a quadratic uh, potential, which generates a force which keeps our particles inside of this given box here. So if you notice in my uh, computational chemistry GitHub repository, in this Jupyter notebook, down in the scripts, molecular mechanics, MM lib directory, I have this energy module, energy.py, where we compute the energy functions. And the function there actually include for the boundaries. Let's see, get E bound. Yep, so for every particle, I actually have in the boundary condition, either it as a cube or as a sphere, there's a quadratic uh, potential if you are outside the boundaries of the cube or the sphere, whereas you are just zero if you are inside the sphere. So that is my crude attempt for modeling these types of boundary conditions, whereas in a more advanced uh, simulation package, you would include uh, what are called usually uh, Ewald or particle mesh Ewald summation methods for the electrostatic interactions with all these infinite number of image particles.